Hello everyone and welcome to EduSearch Clinics. I am Dr. Gunjal Desai and today we are going to continue our discussion on inguinal hernia. And in this talk, we are going to discuss a lot of important points on the various differential diagnosis that we saw in the previous uh, lecture. If you have not seen the content, we have already discussed hernia anatomy in elaborate detail both laparoscopic and open. We have seen how to take history, the different types of hernias. We have seen also the clinical examination of hernias and what are the differential diagnosis. So when it comes to diagnosing a patient in hernia, tests are less important and history taking and clinical examination is very important. And that is why this series is focusing a lot on the clinical approach and the anatomy of hernia. So once you have seen the history taking and the examination has been performed, differential diagnosis is there in your mind and the anatomical concepts are clear. At the most, a test that you may need to diagnose is an ultrasound abdomen and pelvis and usually we always advise bilateral inguinoscrotal regions. So what we now need to understand is how we can differentiate the various etiologies when it comes to inguinoscrotal swelling. And then once we know it's a hernia, how we can differentiate the different types of hernias. We will also look at some important points that are commonly asked in various exams relevant to inguinal hernia as well as the layers covering the inguinal Hernia. So this is going to be a very exam oriented as well as practical video. So pay attention. You can take screenshots of these slides for ready retina towards your exam preparation. So we will see the inguinal hernia first. We have already seen these points, but now we are going to compare and contrast the points between hernia, hydrocele and varicocele, three of the most common differential diagnosis when it comes to inguinoscrotal swelling. So in hernia, the onset is usually sudden or gradual and often after straining. It starts above the inguinal ligament when it's an inguinal hernia, as we have seen. Consistency, the various consistencies we have discussed. Important is elastic in enterocele and doe in omentocele. Expansile impulse is present in reducible hernias. Gurgling may be felt if it's an enterocele get above the swelling is not possible. And this is a very important point because it differentiates inguinal hernia from hydrocele as well as varicocele. Okay. Transillumination is a test that is classically done in hydrocele and it's diagnostic of hydrocele unless there is thickened fluid or it's encysted. Test is usually is palpable separately unless it's a complete hernia whereas testes is not separately palpable in cases of hydrocele. Usually, these patients have a dragging pain or an obstruction symptoms or strangulation symptoms when it's an inguinal hernia, whereas it's more of a cosmetic concern and pain only if it is a tense large hydrocele. Varicocele can often present as a cause for infertility or dragging scrotal pain. The important points in varicocele, usually it is in young adults and bag of warm spill is classical. Okay, It disappears on lying down but reappears on standing. When it comes to hydrocele, it is predominantly cystic and fluctuant and cough impulse is absent. So these are some of the important points that you need to understand to differentiate these three common etiologies. Now, when we come to hernias, we have already seen how an inguinal hernia behaves in the previous table. Here, we will compare and contrast it with direct inguinal hernia and femoral hernia. This is important because sometimes you can confuse these hernias. So, between inguinal and femoral, we already know the location is different because it passes through the femoral canal and the relation to Inferior epigastric vessels as well as pubic tubercle helps you in identification of inguinal versus femoral hernia. We have discussed initially femoral hernia is more common in females and the neck of the sac is narrow. Okay, Usually it is irreducible and the cuff impulse is absent. Strangulation is very common in femoral hernias. 
in all other hernias, male is predominantly affected than female. Expansal cough impulse can be present in both direct as well as indirect hernias. Remember that indirect is more common in young patients, whereas direct is more common in older adults, usually due to weakness of the abdominal wall. Direct can reduce on its own, whereas reducibility may be after manipulation in indirect hernia. We have already seen the special tests that help in differentiating the Zeman technique, the imagination test as well as ring occlusion test. So that is what you can also mention in this table. And the important point is relation to inferior epigastric vessels as indirect hernia comes through the deep inguinal ring. It is lateral to the vessel, whereas direct inguinal hernia is a defect in the posterior wall of the inguinal canal through the hazel back triangle. And so it is medial to the inferior epigastric vessels. So that is what you have to remember when you want to differentiate the various hernias. Now, enterocele versus omentocele is a very commonly asked question. Like I said, we are going to address some commonly asked questions. So this video is very exam oriented as well as very practical. Enterocele, the first part is difficult to reduce, but once some part of intestine enters the abdomen, it is easier to reduce. There is a gurgling sound on reduction. It is resonant on percussion due to air in intestine. Peristalsis can be seen and bowel sounds can be heard. Omentocele, the first part is easier to reduce, whereas the last part is difficult and the feel is doing. It is dull on percussion. Now, this is a slide that we have already discussed in the anatomy section, but this is a very important topic when it comes to hernias. And that is why we are just revising it here so that your exam-oriented material is all present at one point. So inguinal ligament, Popper's ligament are both derived from external oblique aponeurosis. Cooper ligament becomes the pectineal ligament. Lacunar ligament is the gimbernet's ligament. Iliopubic tract is fascia transversalis, is the internal reflection of the inguinal ligament. External spermatic fascia is the external oblique aponeurosis. Cremastric fascia is the union of internal oblique and transversus abdomen is aponeurosis. And internal spermatic fascia is fascia transversalis. Mid inguinal point is the femoral artery pulsation and it is medial to the midpoint of inguinal ligament, which is the deep inguinal ring. There are not less than 20 multiple choice questions in this slide. Remember this for life, okay? Coverings of hernias commonly asked. So now it is easy. We already have a video on abdominal wall when we discuss the ventral hernia. So you can have a look there. If you have not seen that video, it's a very important video because we have also discussed the various layers where the mesh is placed. So in indirect hernia from outside to inside, it's skin, superficial fascia, external oblique aponeurosis, which gives the external spermatic fascia, cremaster muscle from internal oblique, and fascia transversalis, which forms the internal spermatic fascia. After this is the extra peritoneal connective tissue and fat, and then it is the peritoneum from which the Hernial sac is derived through processus vaginalis. So this is from outside to inside for indirect inguinal hernia. In direct inguinal hernia, again, it's skin, superficial fascia, external oblique aponeurosis, premaster fascia and muscle, but this may be thin or absent in direct hernia, or you may have conjoined tendon if the hernia is coming through that part. Transversalis fascia is the main covering when it comes to direct inguinal hernia because it protrudes directly through the hazel back triangle. Then again, you have the extra peritoneal connective tissue and then the peritoneum, which is the hernial sac. So again, a commonly asked question. If you know the previous slide, this becomes very easy. So with that, we come to a conclusion on the entire journey from anatomy of hernia to history taking to clinical examination and to an approach to diagnosis. We have covered this in over two hours of discussion on hernia. And after this, the only part that remains is the treatment. And we will discuss that in upcoming sessions. Thank you.